Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, today's seminar. Uh, today, we are very excited to host uh, Dr. Alessandro Rizzo. Alessandro Rizzo is an associate professor at Politecnico di Torino in Italy, where he directs the Complex Systems Laboratory. He's also a visiting professor at the Institute of Invention, Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the New York University Tandon School of Engineering. Dr. Rizzo conducts and supervises research on modeling, analysis and control of complex systems and networks, distributed estimation and control, bio-inspired and distributed robotics and nonlinear dynamics. He holds two international patents. He authored one book and more than 200 papers in peer-reviewed international journals and conference proceedings. He's also a senior member of the IEEE and the distinguished lecturer of the IEEE Nuclear and Plasma Science Society. and was the recipient of two Amazon Research Awards in robotics in 2019 and 2021. Dr. Riso will uh, talk today about epidemic modeling and forecasting, a journey from the cocktail assumption to the advent of agent-based computations Let's give a warm round of applause to our speaker, a virtual round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, it is a, a pleasure and an honor to be a guest of uh, an institution of which I was an active part uh, for three years between 2013 and 2016. I was physically at NYU before landing a new job at uh, Politecnico di Torino. And so as I typically, uh, I mean, as typically talks that tend to get fast towards the end uh, and tends to be cut towards the end, I would like to start uh, from the, what is typically the end of a talk. So I would like to start with uh, thanking all my uh, coworkers, not all, but the main coworkers and collaborators of this area of uh, research. Um, Sachit, Emanuele, Mattia, Zongping, Francesco, Maurizio, Agnieszka, and Lorenzo, and all uh, the graduate and undergraduate students uh, that uh, uh, contributed to develop this research line. Very briefly, I work in Torino. Torino is a north uh, city in the northwest of about 1 million inhabitants in the northwest of Italy, where the red dot is. <clears throat> it's close to the Alps. Uh, it's a very beautiful city surrounded by three rivers, uh, two football teams that are uh, uh, very competitive uh, to each other that basically splits the city in two parts. Uh, and uh, then there is my laboratory, the complex system laboratory, where we basically uh, work uh, at the border of many disciplines. Uh, but typically we have uh, two uh, distinct research lines in complex systems, one that is more oriented towards technology in robotics, uh, distributed robotics and its applications, and the one, another one about socio-technical systems. Today, I will guide you through a journey in the latter area about the epidemic uh, systems that are a typical example of complex social system. So our journey today um, will go through um, a brief concept uh, about uh, forecasting and modeling uh, using a typical example that is more familiar to us, that is the example of the uh, weather, um, weather forecast. And we, we will do a, a little comparison with the epidemic forecasting and modeling. And then we will delve, of course, into epidemic modeling that is the core of our uh, cocktail today, or sorry, talk today starting from the very, very basic uh, model for, um, for epidemic that is what I usually call the cocktail assumption. So that, it, that assumes that everyone is in a big shaker and a big mixer and everyone is able <coughs> to contact everyone else basically in no time. And then, uh, I mean, this is just, you know, um, a model to understand the basics of the, of the epidemic spreading. And then we will uh, start our, what I call the path to reality. Basically, we will start to remove all the, you know, restricting assumption to go uh, towards uh, uh, models on static social systems, then on dynamical social system. Then we will start to see people moving from one location to another using what we call meta-population models, and then, and then ending 
to what we call the agent-based model. So all these models have uh, advantages and disadvantages. So we will see that there's no uh, good model for everything. There's no uh, one size fits all. So let's start uh, the, the journey. Of course, feel free to interrupt me whenever you want if you have questions. So let's start a bit about forecasting and modeling. This was our, I think this was our first, uh, our idea of forecasting before 2020. This was our main idea of forecasting. We were studying the circulation of air masses uh, on Earth, trying to predict uh, important uh, um, weather phenomena. And then we, in our devices, we were used to look at dashboards, giving us uh, basically temperatures, humidity, wind, state of the weather. After 2020, another idea of forecasting sadly uh, invaded our life. That is the uh, modeling and forecasting of epidemics of, of our current pandemic, um, COVID-19, that uh, shares some similarities uh, with the weather forecast, but we will see it is not exactly the same. So some characteristics are kept. Of course, we want to depict scenarios in the foreseeable future, given the observation of the present. And there is um, an important uh, geographical aspect uh, to be studied because nowadays we travel a lot. So it's not like in the 13th century when everyone was confined in, its own, in its, uh, his or her own village, but now we move a lot. So uh, we need also to uh, involve this aspect. And the dashboards that we sadly study, of course, we sadly observe are not those of the temperatures, but they are those of the infections, uh, vaccination, deaths, casualties, etc. <clears throat> so these two things um, have, um, let's say, a roadmap, a strategy in common, that is the strategy that we use for forecasting. And it basically, everything starts from a model. A model is a mathematical tool that we use to try to reproduce the phenomena under observation. And we start from the model selection, so starting understanding the type of the questions that we want to use to model our system. Then we need data. We need to analyze the available data. From these data, we want to do an inference of the relevant parameters that we need to make our model run in time. And then we need to perform a calibration most of the time. So we have to fix all the parameters of the model to validate the, the model with the existing data. And then we start to project our forecasting in future, doing an assessment of our prediction. So typically, we have a finite time horizon through which we do our prediction. And then we are happy with our prediction, with our assessment, uh, until there is a deviation between the prediction, the forecasting, and the actual reality. And typically, we have to go back to step three, or two, or one, depending uh, on uh, um, how deep is this deviation and how much we have to correct our model, adapting it to the new condition. So we need models. And this is basically the difference between uh, the weather forecasting models and the epidemic models. So the mathematics of weather is much more complex. We basically know this mathematics since the 18th century or so. And the epidemic uh, uh, surrounding the, sorry, the mathematics surrounding the epidemics is much simpler. So where is the difficulty? Where the difficulties are? In weather forecast, uh, there is the difficulty of the complex equations. Um, a long time ago, there was no time. It, they required too long, a too long time to be simulated. So the forecast arrived after the phenomena uh, already occurred. And also there is an extreme sensitivity to initial conditions that basically uh, make our weather model deviating from the um, from the uh, actual uh, phenomena. So there's a very finite time horizon, two, three days, one week or so. Um, on the other hand, uh, in the epidemic modeling, the uh, equations are simple, but there is a, a problem in the accuracy of these equations. In fact, we will see, we will add hypothesis after hypothesis after assumption. There, is a, there are strong sources of stochasticity and more than everything, there is the role of human behavior. 
that is the, let's say, the discriminant between the two systems. In both cases, uh, we typically perform our predictions over a finite time horizon. And we try to answer typical questions that are when an event will occur, where it will be located, how fast and where it will spread. These are common questions. But I have a bonus questions for epidemics. Which intervention policies are best suited? Because behavior makes a difference. The behavior makes the prediction difficult, but also allows ourselves to tame the spread of the pandemic. And concerning epidemic modeling, we have, as I said before, different models for different data for different answers. So we start from very, very coarse models that are very tractable from an analytical point of view, going down to more, more and more complex models that are more and more granular, more and more accurate, more realistic, but they are basically mathematically untractable. We have to simulate them at the computer. So without further ado, let's go through an overview of these models where we will see some modeling techniques and some results that um, the research, my research group and I achieved through these years. So first is the famous cocktail assumption, shaken, not stirred. So this cocktail assumption basically assumes that everyone in a population is in a big mixer and starts to get shaken so that we can contact everyone. Everyone can contact everyone else. Uh, on the top left, uh, we see what we call a progression model. Uh, now, many of you are familiar with this concept. This is a SIR, Susceptible Infected Recovered Model basically supposes that everyone is susceptible to an epidemic, then upon contact with someone gets infected, and then it recovers and it's immune from the epidemics. It's a very simple model. Typically, it has a growth in the cases, then there is the plateau, the peak, and then we go down. Basically, everyone recovers or die, and we are at a stable equilibrium at the end. Uh, the mathematical model is very simple. It's a sort of uh, mass law. Uh, this is S, I, and R is the fraction of people that are susceptible, infected, and recovered, respectively. And basically, we see that uh, the fraction of susceptible decreases according to the proportion of susceptible and infected that mix up uh, using a rate beta that is uh, a function of the infectiousness of the illness. Um, the infected tend to grow uh, according to the same factor uh, with which the um, susceptible decrease, but also tend to decrease with a rate gamma, there is a minus gamma i, that is the recovery rate. So people, infected people tend to recover with a rate gamma. So it's a sort of mass action law. The, the typical uh, mass action that we uh, see in uh, physics 101. Okay, this is a model, very simple. It's based on uh, nonlinear ODEs. However, it's very representative. It could be very representative of uh, real cases. So now we want to focus and study how and when things get bad with this model. So let's start with a little math on top of the model. Okay, so we want to focus on this, the initial part of the epidemics, where things are going to start. So thinking about COVID, end of February, 2020. So here we have a population that is basically mostly susceptible. So S is equal to N, more or less. So we can simplify our first, uh, our second differential equation, DI by DT, almost equal to beta i minus gamma i. This is a very simple differential equation that has a very simple solution. i of zero, e to the gamma, beta over gamma minus one, t. This, of course, has an exponential growth when beta over gamma is greater than one. And then, on the other hand, tends to fade to zero if beta over gamma is less than one. Well, this beta over gamma has a name that many of you maybe are familiar with. It's called R0. R0 is the infamous basic reproduction number. We heard talking about this uh, in the first phase of COVID. If this number R0 is uh, greater than one, then the epidemic spreads in the population. If it's less than one, it, uh, uh, the epidemic will not propagate. So as a definition, 
It is the number of secondary cases generated by a single case in a fully susceptible population. For COVID-19, it's about 2.79, that are between two and three, let's say. It is meaningful, however, in the first phases of the epidemic, when, the, uh, when we are at the start of the process, actually helps to discern between exponential growth or rapid fade out of, the, of an epidemic. And it's a function of the virus itself. It's not a function of the behavior. In fact, it can be computed directly in the field at the beginning of the epidemic. It can be put in relationship with the epidemic parameters, like we did in a very simple manner, beta over gamma, and uh, this uh, can guide us through the selection of the intervention to stop the spread. In fact, if beta over gamma is equal to R naught, it means that if we want to mitigate the impact of the epidemics, we can either decrease beta or increase gamma, or doing both. This means reducing the infectious level of the epidemics or shorten the time uh, in which we are infectious. Of course, being very infectious, infectious does uh, not necessarily imply mortality. So we are around here for COVID, where the orange box here, okay? So it's not a very deadly illness, but um, since it spreads a lot through the population, uh, we, have, uh, we see that we have to manage it very carefully. Actually, this is a potential infectiousness uh, parameter. It's not suitable after the infection has settles in the population. So we have to refer to what we call the effective reproduction number, RT. RT is uh, referred uh, in the, to the blue area where the, where the illness is uh, fully developed. And uh, uh, it is uh, equal to R0 times uh, the fraction of the susceptible population. And uh, this gives us another guideline. Let's reduce the number of susceptible individuals. And now do we reduce the number of susceptible individuals? We vaccinate them or we uh, let them stay at home. There's another very basic uh, uh, model that is uh, the model with reinfection that we call SIS, where we can typically get reinfected. And in this case, we discriminate we, between two behavior with a simple mathematical analysis. It is, there is one scenario where the epidemic goes down, dies out, where lambda divided by mu is less than one. And there is the endemic case where lambda over mu is greater than one. Basically, the number of cases settles around a uh, more or less constant value. In both cases, we have what we call a threshold behavior. So there's um, a ratio parameter, a combination of parameters such that if we are above a threshold, the epidemic develops. If we have below the threshold, the epidemic uh, um, doesn't develop, okay? The expression of the threshold, less than one, greater than one, uh, is not always that simple. Sometimes it's very complex. I'll, I will give you briefly some example, but the concept always applies. There's a combination of parameter. We, we look at these parameters. We try to tame the illness by playing with these parameters that are related, of course, to real phenomena in the field. Also, the, what we call the progression models are not uh, always that simple, okay? Sometimes they are very complicated. On the left-hand side of the slide, you see what we use for Ebola. On here, you see what we use for two strains of COVID. Here, you see a very accurate model, for example, for COVID. So there are different states of the illness uh, and different models that we use to, stu to study different aspects of the illness. Now, if there are no questions, uh, I would like to start our path to reality, starting with the first assumption, remove the first simplification. No man is a vodka drop in a shaker. We are all in a social network. For the moment, let's consider that the social network is static. If the social network is static, we can assume that infections can occur only between the existing links of the population. For the moment, let's consider that they are constant in time. Of course, we can numerically simulate the model and also do some math on it. Of course, it's not that simple. We don't have like the simple differential equations, but still we can do something. And for these kinds of models on social networks, we have important results on the epidemic threshold. Typically, we can derive what we call the adjacency matrix of the population. So a matrix uh, that uh, puts a one where there is a connection between two people and a zero when there is no connection. And we will find that, sorry. Yes, we will find that uh, ah. 
The threshold is a function of uh, the maximum eigenvalues of the adjacency matrix. This is a mathematical formulation, but the meaning means that the threshold now depends on the structure. So on the type, on the topology of the connection, on the number of connections that each person has. And there is a fascinating and debated, debated hypothesis on social structure that is a scale-free network. Basically, this says that in social systems, uh, the social networks may form uh, following a what we call a rich get richer criterion. So where many, many people have a few connections and then there are a few people that have many, many connections. This uh, makes a distribution of the number of contacts per person to follow what we call a power law. Actually, having this power law gives a, a virus, a, virus a, a good opportunity for spreading because what we have, uh, uh, this, what we call the super hubs, the super spreader in the network, the people with many contacts are the best allies, of course, of the virus. And also mathematics tells us because this, um, the expression of the threshold uh, is approximately equal to that ratio, the average number of connection of people divided by the uh, average dispersion of connection, the, let's say the variance. And if there is a, this um, uh, power law of a tail distribution, this, that ratio tends to zero. And the fact that the ratio tends to zero means that the threshold tends to zero. And if the threshold tends to zero, it means that uh, we need just a little infectivity uh, for the illnesses to spread throughout the whole population because there's, there's no threshold. And this is a, actually a worrying situation. Well, this is a, a, our, let's say, first approach to model the illnesses uh, and uh, in static societies. Of course, societies are not, uh, are not uh, static, but here the take home message is, uh, according to these assumptions, beware of the super spreaders. So we have to reduce these sources of heterogeneity. This means that we, when, whenever there is a, pan, a risk of a pandemic, we have to make sure that people have a few connections each and there is a uniform number of connections. Then let's go toward uh, removing another assumption. And sorry, it's not working. Okay, let's remove another assumption, the path to reality part two, no man is a crystal molecule. So we're not fixed in a crystal, we are not in a cocktail. We are not uh, on a, a, say, table soccer game where everyone is fixed in a position. We are more, mostly in a sort of, sorry, in a football game where everyone moves. Uh, Maurizio, this is for you, Sampdoria, Roma, zero to one, if you're watching. Um, so basically, we are all moving in a field, we are all moving on Earth, and basically when we get in touch with our friends or relatives or whatever, we are close enough, we can get uh, uh, the infection. So this is basically now the new rules of the models, okay? The, and the rule is very easy. When two individuals are close enough, the epidemic may spread. So on the right, you see an example that is basically the mimic of uh, people moving on a plane, like in a soccer field or whatever on earth. Um, to model these phenomena that are more realistic, of course, than the uh, all the ease of the simple compact model, we need three ingredients. We need a mobility model. So we need to model how people move. We need to model how people get in touch. And then we need to model how the epidemic spread, the progression model. Now, to simplify a bit uh, things, we started to study these models under what we call a time scale separation. So we we want uh, to study two extreme situations where the epidemic is very slow with respect uh, to the contact patterns and when the epidemic is very fast. Uh, these two assumptions actually are not realistic, but once again, they allow us to understand something about the epidemic. Um, in between, we can study the um, network with a new paradigm that is called activity driven. Um, in activity driven, we get rid of a mobility model and what uh, we and we mimic mobility in some sense uh, through another attitude, another parameter that we call activity. Activity is the 
attitude of people to make contacts with others. It's a number, it's the probability of make, making contacts. So instead of uh, um, inferring how people move, we start to infer how people interact. So we get rid for the moment of the mobility and we try to model the contact model and the epidemic model. Uh, the advantage of uh, this approach is that uh, we can stay in between. We can study where, um, where the illness and the um, for formation of contacts actually uh, are concurrently evolving. So between the uh, approach where the disease dynamics is much slower than the connection formation, it means that we can mix and mingle with everyone and uh, uh, other extreme where the dynamics of the disease is much faster than the connection formation. So this means that we can assume that the graph of the connection is static. We want to understand what happens in the between. That is the basically the re more realistic situation. So we define what we call the activity potential. That is the fraction of the interaction made by an agent divided by the number of the total interaction. And basically this estimates the probability through which we make contact with people. And uh, once again, uh, heuristically, by examining some social experiments, we can infer once again that uh, this activity potential is uh, uh, distributed in a population through a power law, once again. So having this um, activity distribution uh, uh, through a population, we can uh, model now how we make connection, how this uh, network of contacts work and how does it work? It works in a very simple manner. It proceeds in a discrete time. Time after time, there will be some nodes that activate according to their own probability, to their own attitude in making contacts with each other. They make some contacts. Uh, the illness can propagate through these contacts and then these contacts are resumed. Uh, this means that actually both the epidemic and the um, and the network formation evolve at the same uh, pace in time. So, and this guarantee a more realistic feature of the epidemic spreading. Using this paradigm, we modeled uh, epidemic uh, um, epidemic uh, progression, and we found. Uh, an important result about the threshold. I'm not going to go into the mathematics, but what I want to highlight is simply that uh, between the quenched network hypothesis, let's say the, the static one, where it was uh, related to one over the maximum eigenvalue and the other results where we had the annealed network, it means a sort of a, a cocktail assumption for um, time-varying network. In between, uh, the threshold is a function of the average of the activity and the dispersion of the activity of human beings. And once again, we can highlight, uh, um, I, I don't want to um, stay much time on the formula, but basically uh, the formula in the middle says that uh, the heterogeneity in the population, once again, is responsible for decreasing the threshold. So the more the population is heterogeneous, the more, um, uh, the less is the threshold. So the more the epidemic can spread over the population. This model has been very powerful. It's very good, but it's not very realistic because it doesn't include the behavior in the population. So we started to add the behavioral traits into the population. Um, we know that our behavior has been uh, key to stop the spread. So people aware or affected by an epidemic spreading around them change their behavior according to information or health status. And this of course reflects on the parameter. So now once again, I don't want to spend more time on the mathematics, but basically this can reflect on many aspects. For example, it this can reflect on decreasing the infectiousness of, any, of a contact because we are wearing a mask. This can mean decreasing our activity, our probability of making contacts. For example, stay at home uh, mandates or individual choices of staying at home. And this can be basically modeled through a manipulation of the parameters. So, so for example, uh, decreasing the activity of an individual using some 
coefficients. Um, if we apply this uh, mathematical uh, uh, paradigm, we basically can find another epidemic threshold that once again, uh, don't be scared about the mathematics, but the take on message of the formula is uh, the epidemic threshold now with the behavior is a function of the average connection, the average activity in the network, but also of the uh, behavioral traits. So by modulating the behavioral traits, once again, we can have an idea on how the threshold is increasing or decreasing. I just would like, for example, to mention here um, one graph, the one of the top right here, that gives us uh, the uh, number of infected depending on two different sets of behavioral traits. Here, the number of the infected at steady states so or the endemic situation uh, increases much less with the infectiousness of the epidemics uh, uh, with respect uh, to a situation where our, our behavior is basically unchanged when the epidemics spread. With all these ingredients, our first uh, practical result was the modeling of Ebola spreading uh, in the Liberia 2014-2015 outbreak. Uh, uh, if you recall, Liberia, uh, Ebola was a very uh, dangerous epidemic in Western Africa. Uh, it was confined actually to Western Africa, even though uh, uh, there was some casualty around the world, but most of the casualties were uh, in Western Africa, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. Uh, it was a disaster in terms uh, of uh, causalities uh, and also of management because, uh, I mean, in West Africa, there were no the facilities that we have, of course, uh, uh, in our portion of the world. It was uh, a very complicated uh, model to, uh, to be devised. Uh, I can uh, highlight that uh, we worked with a population of more than 4 million individuals with many, many uh, parameters uh, and uh, with many behavioral changes, including um, specific behaviors like the behavior at the traditional funeral, uh, scarcity of data, and other, other problem. The important thing that I would like to highlight is that in this case, we didn't have a mobility model because we didn't know how people move. So that's why we just relied on a, a sort of a, a model uh, that considered only the activity of people that could be uh, inferred through a simple calibration. So we used a, 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 an adequate progression model here, what, uh, what is uh, uh, known to be the Legrand model to model Ebola. We, um, uh, we had to infer many, many parameters, behavioral and other parameters of the model. Uh, we had to draw them, uh, many of them from the literature and we inferred some of them through a numerical optimization. And then eventually we uh, matched uh, the, uh, the course of the epidemics through the calibration that is basically the minimization of an index. Uh, and this is what uh, we call uh, at the beginning, this is the step of the validation of the model. So we, we made sure that the model is reproducing the data. And then finally, we were ready to project our what if scenarios. Okay, so here we train the model on the left hand side of the data, and then we validated the model on the right hand side of the data. Once the model was validated, we were allowed to project our projections in what if scenarios. For example, these are what if scenarios, what happened if we applied uh, prophylaxis before it was applied. So actually uh, prophylaxis were, were applied in mid-August and uh, um, caused a lot of casualties. And uh, we could uh, understand what would have happened if we were more fast, faster, more reactive in trying to stop the spread. Um, so uh, this was our first experience uh, in uh, modeling um, an epidemic. Um, and this, of course, motivated us to complicate more and more our model. So here we didn't have an idea on uh, how about people moved. Going, uh, moving forward, we say, okay, now we want, we can, we can start to add the motion of people between areas of the population if we have a mobility model. 
and we apply this concept uh, to uh, COVID now. This is our basically uh, uh, work on COVID, uh, where I don't have to convince you that uh, spatial modeling is important because also in Italy, we have a starting point from COVID uh, that then spread throughout the whole country through space. So modeling the space is important because space has different characteristics. And also because um, in a, while in a first phase of the pandemic, we controlled the pandemic with a general lockdown, everyone at home. In the end, uh, uh, I mean, after a while in the fall of 2020, we started to try to control the pandemic by applying different procedures. So different restrictions to different regions. So yellow region, less restrictions, orange region, more restrictions, red, rest, red regions, basically full lockdown, okay? So this basically puts the control of an epidemic uh, in the perspective of a spatiotemporal control problem. Now, of course, the control here in epidemic is just uh, um, human behavior. So non-pharmaceutical interventions until we had the vaccine. And of course, finding a right balance among the MPAs it's not trivial, especially for social implication. So in this, uh, in our model now, we are analyzing the interplay between different containment policies. Um, uh, basically the activity reduction, uh, social distance, forbid gatherings and stay at home mandate. And then on the other hand, mobility restriction. How did we model? So remember, I'm going to skip uh, the characteristics uh, because I think we are running short of time. But how did we model the, the system? Remember, we called the Ebola. So everyone had uh, everyone in the same population, a distribution of activity. There were people that uh, were more active, people that were less active, but everyone was in the same, let's say, region. Here, what we are doing, we are connecting more several Ebola-like model, okay? So we model many communities, K communities, um, and then we connect these communities through flow of people that travel between one community and another. We need, of course, more parameter. For example, we need a mobility parameter that measures the fraction of population that commutes to other areas. And we need a, what we call a stochastic routing matrix uh, that measures the direction of the mobility between communities. So basically, these models are evolving uh, autonomously, but also they are exchanging people to give uh, uh, the possibility of uh, modeling the spatial uh, activity of uh, people. Okay, so let's now focus on uh, the progression model. The progression model is a modified uh, SIR where there is this exposed, uh, um, the exposed state that is basically when we are uh, uh, incubating the illness, that is the typical model, simplified model for COVID. And using this model and the spatial, uh, um, the spatial modeling, we modeled uh, um, a spatial model with 107 communities that were corresponding to the Italian provinces. And we uh, took the data from many sources, from the uh, social uh, age stratified data on social contacts, uh, from mobility data, from uh, literature, from COVID-19. And then we had to calibrate some parameters. We calibrated some parameters in different regions. We found other uh, the parameters that were missing. And this, of course, allowed us to project uh, uh, the results on the implementation of the non-pharmaceutical uh, intervention. For example, here, uh, we can estimate the relative variation of death as a function of the mobility restrictions and the activity reduction. We could have uh, um, results uh, into at the national level or at a local level. For example, here we see two different behavior in uh, two different uh, uh, provinces of Italy with two different patterns, of course, of reduction of uh, death. Let me skip this to uh, go to the, to remove the last hypothesis that is uh, the last step of the path to reality that I call the map is the territory. And this is the, 
let's say, the most granular uh, example of modeling, it is what we call the agent-based model. It's, it is basic, an agent-based model is like a SimCity game. It is basically a model where we have a, a, a single particle, a single software agent that emulates the behavior of a single individual. And then we have to gather the data uh, for these individuals and we have to simulate the individual behavior. So to simulate this, uh, it's a matter of uh, mastering and joining together computer science, uh, mathematics, uh, computing power, visualization, data analysis, a very complex uh, activity. Um, we did this, we started this at the very beginning of the COVID pandemic, pandemic also thanks to an NSF grant that uh, um, Maurizio was awarded uh, in early, if I recall correctly, early 2021. Alessandro, and so, maybe yes. another five minutes? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, let's uh, go briefly over the ingredient of this very complex model, actually. So the first ingredient is the city database. Well, that we started by manually populating a geographical database of the city using data from the US census, uh, geographical data from the OpenStreetMap, data about the hospitals from the New York State Department of Health, uh, data on schools from the National Center for Education Statistics, and so on. So we started by studying all the features of the city by analyzing all the available data sources. Um, in this way, we started to create a virtual household structures and a virtual population uh, where we mapped uh, each single software agent to each single, pop uh, each single inhabitant of the city. In this case, we are focusing, sorry, I forgot to mention, we are focusing on New Rochelle in New York State, so um, more or less 80,000 inhabitants. So the first ingredient is the data about the city. The second ingredient is a complex and realistic progression model. I'm not going to the detail. This is a basic an SEIR model, but where the I has different, uh, let's say, variation and that, that are basically related to treatment in a hospital, in home, uh, in a specific structures. And then we have other states that are dead uh, death through different paths and recovered through different paths. Um, so it's a complex, uh, and also, for example, sorry, I forgot to mention here in hospitals, we have the hospitalization in ICU, hospitalization in normal uh, um, uh, section of the hospital or hospitalization treatment at home and so on. So it's a very complex model that captures uh, many, many details of the epidemic progression of an individual. The third ingredient, we have to generate a synthetic population according to the characteristic of the population that we inferred from data. And we had to define probabilistic rules according to which the state of health of a person evolved. And of course, these are the basic uh, probabilities, the basic infection uh, risks uh, in the mathematical model. And then we had to, of course, uh, put forward many, many more conditional probability computations to determine the state transitions. After we had all the model, finally, we can calibrate the model. So we can uh, run many, many instances of our model and compare through uh, different instances of uh, different run of our model with the real data. And once, like Ebola model, we make sure that we are able to reproduce the data, we can project in the future different uh, what-if scenarios. For example, here um, we are uh, simulating no vaccinations, vaccination of hospital employees, vaccination of school employees, and so on. Um, of course, if there are substantial changes in the epidemic dynamics, the model needs a recalibration, as I said before. Uh, this uh, ABM model uh, has been used to answer several questions. Uh, we published uh, four papers uh, on the matter, so about uh, the original model, about the safe reopening of cities, about uh, predicting the effects of waning vaccine immunity, and then there is a fourth one in press uh, about the exploration of the endemic scenario of COVID. So I think this uh, concludes our overview. 
And I just uh, would like to conclude with some uh, take home message uh, and this uh, uh, very quick journey about epidemic modeling. I would like just to highlight the uh, most important uh, um, traits of what we covered. And uh, my, I would like to give my final point of reflection and consideration. First, that epidemic modeling, of course, is a complex matter. Uh, it involves stochasticity, uncertainty in, in the parameters, but also, and most importantly, human behavior. The role of human behavior is a double-edged sword. It complicates things a lot, but it is a control variable. Using human behavior, we can tame and stop an epidemic. Of course, we saw this with COVID. We have different models from different data for different answers. There's no a right model. There's no one size fits all. We have to design a model for a specific aim. There's a common trait, the limitedness of the prediction horizon in time and the projection of scenarios rather than exact prediction. So we use model to do what if hypothesis. It's not like uh, we want to infer the temperature of a material after a couple of seconds, but we would like to see what if I vaccinate a quarter of the population? What if I protect the elderly? What if I close schools? So more qualitatively than quantitatively. Our quest for the future, of course, is attaining both high accuracy and mathematical tractability. Of course, I don't know if this is going to be possible. This maybe contradicts the second principle of thermodynamics, but I, I hope we can improve uh, our models. And also modeling has a great utility also in what we call a peacetime, uh, because models uh, should be used to improve awareness, to disseminate uh, the awareness about the epidemics and to be prepared uh, for hopefully a never happening uh, next uh, pandemic. Uh, of course, I hope we get rid of this one before worrying about the next one. And uh, I think it's uh, 44 minutes and five, 59 seconds, 45 minutes, zero one, according to my timer. So I would like to thank again uh, all the friends, colleagues, and collaborators. Uh, these are my um, contacts, Twitter, website, and uh, email. And yeah, I'm, if you have some questions, I'm here to answer your questions. Thank you, Dr. Ariza. Thank you for the comprehensive presentation. Um, so we have 10 to 15 minutes to take questions for, from the audience. You're welcome to raise your hands. And I see I see at least a few people applauding in the, in the audience. I don't know if you can see it on the screen. Um, so feel free to raise your hand uh, or put the questions in the chat. Um, I have one question from Paolo Silva, you're welcome to unmute your mic and ask our speaker. So, um, thank you. Um, do you, you listen to me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, good. Okay. So, thank you, Alessandro. Very interesting um, talk. Uh, I have worked a little bit with this kind of models too, and I stopped it in the compartmental models and some geographic variations, things like that, basically because I wanted to do optimization and use theory of control and things like that to, to drive uh, how to intervene in the society. And for that, I needed um, gradients and things like that. So if I understand well, once you go to that kind of agent-based model, you basically have to calibrate um, the model by doing many runs and you don't have really a way of doing it systematically. You just have to test many, many parameters it's like that. You have a, how you do that? Because with so many parameters to test, yeah, the, the, uh, the search tree is just too large. So I, I don't yeah. see how you can do it without. Um, Actually, the of... trick is the following. We have, uh, uh, I, I maybe went too fast uh, in the last part of the talk, but the trick is, uh, many, I would say the majority of the parameters is derived from medical and social literature. So for example, in, in Ebola model, uh, I had maybe more than 30 parameters. I, I inferred only four parameters from, uh, from the optimization. Let me go through, through Ebola. I didn't, I didn't uh, put all the parameters for COVID because they are too many. But if you see here, these are the parameters for, uh, uh, can you see the screen? 
Yep. Uh, these are the parameters for uh, for Ebola. Uh, the blue, all the blue one were taken from the literature. Only the orange one were taken from uh, calibration. I see. Uh, we're doing an optimization, and with four parameters, we could we could do a quite a good uh, multivariate uh, search with standard optimization techniques in reasonable time. For uh, for COVID, it's been more or less the same thing. Of course, a bit more parameters, but a very high computing power, so we could uh, exploit. Uh, uh, let's say more powerful algorithm but the concept is always the same go to the medical literature um, browse the medical literature take most of the parameters from them fix them and then infer what you really don't know for example if you see here in ebola what i didn't know was the average number of connections that that is that m parameter the gamma that is the exponent of the distribution of the activities of people and the two behavioral parameters that are basically number that uh, have don't have a let's say a physical quantity so they have to be inferred but if you have multiple populations the parameters they 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 depend on the population yeah so yeah. they will just grow very fast if you have multiple. Um, yeah, in, fa in fact, uh, in fact, there is a great difficulty in uh, uh, finding geographically distributed data. But for example, for for Italy, so here, of, of course, uh, the the ABM uh, in uh, that we developed with uh, with um, the NSF grant with Maurizio was uh, uh, focused on a uniform population uh, on New Rochelle. Um, fortunately, for example, for Italy, we found that the, the data that had the, the geographical distribution, so we could uh, use all the data. But of course, the dimension of the problem grows a lot. There are people that are colleagues that uh, do uh, epidemic, epidemic modeling at world scale. Alessandro Vespignani from North, Northeastern University, for example, does epidemic modeling at world scale. Thank okay, you. okay, thank you. Uh, are there more questions from from the audience? You're welcome to raise your hand or unmute your mic. If not, I have a quick question, maybe until people warm up. So, Dr. Rizzo, you you shared a, a breadth of applications and techniques. Do you do you see maybe through these applications um, ways to couple scales? Uh, to couple the time scales or maybe computational techniques that are maybe more efficient when we're trying to understand phenomena across scales? Uh, well, um, I'm not a computing expert, but uh, basically there are uh, techniques where uh, that are, for example, from the simulation optimization area where basically you can uh, uh, assess uh, the performance of some simplified model through, for example, what we call bootstrap techniques. And basically you run a bunch of, uh, uh, si uh, of simplified models that basically give you the answer in no time. And then you assess the performance of the model and then you decide if that answer from that model is statistically significant. So if you're happy with that answer or if you need to recalibrate the model and start the whole process and uh, start and launch a more granular model. So this is what I envisage basically. So start with a simplified one. And uh, if you see that the, the performance is degrading, you go down to the granularity and use more computing power to do another round of calibration. Great, thank you so much. Are there more questions from the audience? And I have, okay, one more question. So there was this, there was this example, I think in the, in the first example where um, the network, we were trying to find the super spreaders and we were looking at the number of contacts of someone. And there was a link with the, the social interactions and the social networks. Now in the sort of rich get richer example, 
I would I would think that also the weight of the links plays a role. So for example, maybe a CEO of a large company is only connected to a few people in terms of time, how much time they spend and they meet, but mm -hmm. the weight, so the influence that they have to these people and the influence of these people downstream plays an important role. So do you see similarities where sort of the weight, maybe the quality of the interactions that people have, if I spend more time with someone, uh, plays an important role in the spread of a disease. So if being more tightly connected and whether this plays into your models. Uh, well, um, this is one of those simplifying assumptions that uh, uh, I had to take. So basically um, what we are doing in our model. So let's start from the beginning. In the static model, uh, there was no weight attached. So it was just a count of the, um, uh, of the connection. In the activity-driven model, you, uh, this is implicitly included in the concept of activity. Because basically, if you have an, a high activity, a high activity parameter, a high activity potential, this means that uh, you have a more probability to connect with people at a certain time. So basically, it's not like you do a long connection, but basically if you observe the system in one hour, you have many, many connections in that hour. Uh, in the ABM, on the other hand, uh, uh, we had the data about uh, how much time, how long people spend in their location and the probability that uh, two people can get in touch and get infected over a certain time horizon. So that was included. And as you can see in the formulas, basically the probability of getting infected faded in time uh, with an exponential. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rizzo. And obviously these are large scale models. I understand that it's really, really hard to run and, and calibrate. And um, in this process, and we saw some uh, some impressive accuracy. So basically, basically one thing that I would like to mention: sometimes um, you are not in, you are not interested, uh, of, of or better, of course, you would like that all your parameters have a physical meaning. But sometimes you are happy if you find a parameter that makes your data match. Of course, making sense. Um, because there you can produce your what-if scenarios. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for example, in my Ebola model, I really don't know if it's true that a person uh, contacts on average seven persons in a Makes unit sense. time, okay? But I think it's a reasonable number. And since this matches my data, of course, there might be different combinations of parameters. Maybe there would be seven and a half and a little uh, less infectiousness. But this, of course, uh, this is the the um, the aim of the game is to uh, reproducing the spread with reasonable parameters. It's not finding the exact parameters. Thank you, thank you for the perspective. Yeah, and I, I think all, all of us would wish for much much better data, uh, for sure, and more granular. So, yeah, um, if people don't have more questions, I would like to. Um, Thank the speaker one more time. There's a there's can there's a there's a hands okay. raised. Can us okay. by maybe we can we can we can take that and maybe finish the off by maybe we close. Yeah, a quick yeah, yeah, win. Let's do that. Go ahead, Can. Can us by I think yeah, you can go ahead. We're not hearing you though if you're speaking. Maybe change your mind. Go ahead. So, volume, yeah, the sound doesn't go through. I'm not sure what's the problem. Drop me an email. Yeah. <laughs> if I'll put again. We, we my... can see you. We can see you, but we cannot hear you. Yeah. Okay. So, we will. We will end the seminar. Let's give another round of applause to our Thank speaker. You. Thank you so much. We will Thank meet you very again. much.
We'll meet again in two weeks with Dr. Jennifer Pomerantz um, online. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Rizzo. And I hope to see you again in New York City soon. Bye-bye. Have a good day.